Nehemiah chapter 2, you know, Pastor has been talking about um, rebuilding, and we are in a rebuilding phase. You may remain seated uh, for the reading of this word. I'm going to read uh, three specific scriptures, and then uh, we're going to uh, do what the Lord has assigned me to do. So, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, it says, Then Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it. They heard that Nehemiah had showed up. They heard of, of, of the different things that he didn't, he never said anything, but he was just investigating things. And he said that they heard. How did they hear something? They, they didn't hear, he never said anything yet, but how did they hear something? They were deeply disturbed that a man, hear this, had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. They were deeply disturbed that someone cared enough to come see about them. Verse 17, then I said to them, this is Nehemiah talking to the people, talking to the elders of Jerusalem, saying, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. The word reproach there means disappointment. So that we may no longer be a disappointment, be a stain to the kingdom, be a shame. In Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 6 says, so we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. Thank you. I'm going to speak from a simple subject, the rebuild, the rebuild, the rebuild. Thank you. The first chapter of the book of Nehemiah introduces the book bearing his name as a resident of Susa, the capital of the Persian Empire. When Nehemiah heard that the walls of Jerusalem were still broken down, more than half a century after the completion, half a century, 50 years, after the completion of the rebuild of the temple, he sat down and wept fasting and praying before God. More than 50 years had gone by since they rebuilt the temple. Over 18,500 days had passed, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. These people, although they had built the temple, they walked by the wall. Another generation has now grown up in Jerusalem, passing by the wall, Every single day. Now, there is something significant about the wall, and I'll tell you about it later. But they rebuilt the temple, but they didn't rebuild the wall. The question becomes, what kept them from rebuilding the wall? They rebuilt the temple, but why would you not be rebuild the wall? The, so some of you would suggest to me, if I ask you in a very intimate setting, and I said, well, tell me why do you think that they did not rebuild the wall? Well, some of you would immediately say, well, let me tell you, the reason why, it's obvious because God sent Nehemiah to do it. It was his assignment. It was his purpose. It was his destiny to become the leader. However, I would refute that claim to you because I would say you are in Jerusalem. This is not just like any city. This is the this is the, the this is the mecca of life in Judaism. This place is 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 like Dallas, Texas. It's like the city of Dallas. Everything moves and everything comes in by what? By the power that is in Dallas. It, it, you, you, so some of you would say it's a leadership thing. It's a leadership thing. Uh, but I would even refute that again because I would say, do you understand that the Sanhedrin Council, do you understand that the rule, how many rulers and rabbis and teachers and architects and creatives lived in the city of Jerusalem? How come that over 50 years passed and nobody took up the rank. Nobody took the responsibility to rebuild the wall. 
And then somebody would say, no, no, Pastor Travis, you don't understand. You don't understand. Let me tell you, listen, when anybody's trying to build anything, you got to have people. You got to have human resource. If you don't have the human resource, you can have a great vision. You can have a great, a great dream. But if you don't have the people to support you, then guess what? It will not be accomplished. Can I tell you that chapter 3 unfolds, if you read your Bible, chapter 3 unfolds all the individuals. All the individuals inside of Jerusalem that decided to help in this effort. Everybody from, from every walk of life, from every industry, from every profession, they decided at this time. So the issue is not a leadership issue. Wow, listen to me. The, the other issue is not a human resource issue because there was enough people. And then some of you would say, well, no, 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 you don't understand because if, if, you, if you don't have a leadership issue, if you have a people issue, then guess what? Then you you have a resource issue because guess what you can't do nothing without money and when, and when you don't have money, you ain't going to be able to build anything. But can I tell you that 95% of the resources that they needed for the project was already in Jerusalem. I feel like preaching already. Everything. Now, they did bring the seal of the Persian king. They did bring the endorsement. And they did bring some things from Persia. But the bulk of the resources were already in Jerusalem. So the question becomes now, the question becomes, I begin to answer, what is the issue then? If it's not a human resource issue and not a leadership issue and not, not a human resource issue, what, what, what keeps a people who have promise on their life? What keeps a people that have an anointing? What keeps a people that have walked with God, that have talked with God, that have seen generations of uh, generations and seen the miracles that God has done? What is it that keeps these people that have cre uh, uh, creativity and uh, uh, amazing talent and amazing gifting and amazing wealth. What keeps a people from rebuilding a wall? Can I tell you, you can be anointed, you can be gifted, you can be talented, you can be educated, you can, you can, you can, you, 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 you can be creative. But can I tell you, in my hermeneutical investigation and analysis of the text, you know what I've discovered? That that pretty much the only thing that can keep someone from fulfilling an assignment that they need to, to fulfill, even if they have a prophetic word, even if they have an anointing, even if they have gifting, even if they have help, even if they have the right people around them, even if they're in the right marriage, even if they have the right job, what will keep a person from fulfilling their assignment is one word. It's called trauma. The one thing that will keep you from never feeling like you're enough when you have everything that you need <laughs> it's called, somebody help me, trauma. What will keep you bound when God has blessed you, don't get tight on me. I already felt some of y'all get tight on me when I, when I deal with this trauma. I, I felt some of y'all get, don't get tight on me. L look at Jennifer and say, don't get tight on him. Don't, 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 don't get tight. What, 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 what will keep you bound mentally? <laughs> it's a thing called trauma. And the truth of the matter is, Truth of the matter is, when we talk about the word trauma, many of you would immediately think about sexual abuse. Immediately, what would come to mind is a tragic car accident or domestic violence, somebody being robbed or beating. Uh, 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 you would think of somebody being held at gunpoint, being robbed and held at gunpoint. And I am not trying to minimize any of those things. You, you would think of someone being, uh, some of you survived Hurricane Katrina. Some of you who walk through different things and seasons in your life. An alcoholic father who beat your mother. All of these types of scenarios that come to our lives that we never asked for. When we talk about trauma, we are referring, listen to me, are to events that would be unsettling to nearly everyone 
that is involved with a reaction of fear, helplessness, or terror. When I talk about trauma, it is fear, helplessness, or terror. So some of you may have not gone through what I have suggested, but maybe when you were younger, I'm going to talk to the season says, maybe it was when you were younger and you were going to try out for the, for the basketball team or you are going to try out for the cheerleading squad or you were going to do something that was outside of your family's confound, that, that, that there was words that they spoke out of their mouth discrediting your passion or your belief to do something. And even though that sounds minimal even though it doesn't sound significant you have held on to that thing for years you built your life you built your career you built everything around you but the reason why you don't have significant intimate relationships because you fear abandonment you fear that anyone who challenges you okay I'm a I, I see I gotta work in here so it doesn't always have to be these physical Things because with a physical trauma, I can see the physical damage. But can I tell you that most of us we don't suffer with the physical trauma, but there are mental scars that we live with every single day. And here's the truth of the matter is that COVID 19, I know y'all sick of that word, I am too. People that already, psychologists have already said, have already proven that people that already had a history in trauma, COVID-19 amplified their anxiety. It amplified their depression. It amplified their loneliness. It amplified their insignificance. It amplified everything around them. Why? Because COVID-19 brought about a vulnerability, an uncertainty, and a terror that was marked by months of uncertainty. As a matter of fact, research has spanned to 24 countries on six continents that 70% of adults reported one or more traumas in their lifetime. When you deal with trauma, Visible or invisible, there is no escaping it. Well, most of you, let me tell you, if you dealt with any significant trauma, you know what you have done. You, you do what psychologists or therapists call disassociation. It is there, it taunts you, it, it is there, but you move away from it. And some people, that's how you get caught up in addiction. Because you, dis you never deal with it, you just disassociate from it. Oh. That's why some people have committed suicide, not because they didn't have a purpose and a destiny before them, but they don't realize that the path toward healing is not avoiding what you went through, but dealing with what I got to stop stopping. But this is my but dealing with what you've gone through. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you ah, that 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 when we deal with trauma, there is no escaping. There's no escaping it. When you enter the world of trauma, trauma handicaps your ability to adjust to the external world. <laughs> when, you, when we deal with the deep effects of trauma, there's not just one size fits all. There's people when they engage in trauma or childhood trauma or adulthood trauma. Because guess what? You may not have gone through anything as a child, but when you got into your career, you had all these hopes and you had all these dreams and people shut doors in your face. People said things. People, And guess what? Those have a significant impact imprint into your mind and your mentality on how you see yourself and how you see the world. Some of you have words of your life, but you won't fulfill them. You know why? Because, because trauma has strapped you to the seat of not enough. Because somebody told you where, who in the world? It's like God, who, oh God, it's like God talking to Adam and Eve. Who told you that you were naked? Who told you you were not chosen? Who told you that who you couldn't? Oh my God. Who told you that you had to settle for this? Who told you that you were not enough? Who told you that you were not? Oh. 
Who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you that you couldn't be everything God designed you to be? Who told you that your marriage couldn't heal? Who told you that you were never going to be enough? Who told you? What lie have you believed? Who told you you were not pretty enough? Who told you you were not tall enough? Who told you you were insignificant, that you were not significant enough? Who told you that? Oh, you know what I found out, Pastor Brady? You know what I found out? In my research, I found out this very significant thing, that there is a group of psychologists, there's a group of therapists that did some discovery, that they begin to, uh, there's adolescents, they, they do adolescence counseling, and they realize that there's some young people, there were young people uh, that came in with very uh, severe signs of anxiety and very severe, uh, severe signs of depression. And so what they did, they they took them through the therapies they took them through the modalities and they discovered that the child had not gone through anything of significance to deem it as traumatic but what they did discover is the questions that they asked them they said did your mom almost have a miscarriage what happened to your mom before she gave birth what happened in your mother's life so they start going beyond the person to the next general to the gener to, to the previous generation and then what they didn't stop there they went back to another previous generation so the child had to end up investigating not only their parents history but they had to do their grandparents history and so can I tell you they have concluded that there are children there are adults now that are suffering issues not because they had the issue themselves but it was passed through their bloodline can I tell you whatever you're dealing with whatever you're going through when you give birth to your children that's why you can't have a baby by everybody because you don't know what people have been through you don't know what's passed through their blood You don't know what people have passed through people's bloodline. I know they're cute. I know he's handsome. I know she's beautiful, but you don't know what's in their bloodline You don't know what they have I know that just made some of y'all nervous because you try to figure out, oh Lord, who did I marry? Yeah, you, you figured out once she got married, ooh, y'all dysfunctional, ooh, y'all crazy, ooh, y'all this. And guess what? You try to figure out why your child acting all crazy, it's because guess what? They came from crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just joking. But the truth of the matter is, and you know what, Pastor? I did my own self-study. I did my own self-study. I realized that my mom, watch this, fed my brother and I zucchini, squash, broccoli, lettuce, meatloaf. I mean, our plate was really, really covered. Carrots. She, she, she had a different uh, type of palate. And uh, she would make us sit there. Um, yeah. <laughs> it gets cold. That was before, right before the microwave, but if it got cold, you still had to eat it, you had to blow on it. Just make it hot. You better make it hot because guess what? It's, you're going to eat it today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what I realized, Pastor, is that all of my children love zucchini, squash. They love, they love spinach. They love kale. They love all the things that my mother exposed me to. Y'all gonna miss that and say, everything that they expose me to, my children, and you may say, no, 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 you must understand, listen, my children are not that way. I'm just telling you that there are sometimes things that the, the mapping of your DNA, watch this, is mapped also not just by your, your outward exterior, exterior or uh, by your genes, but that gene pool also can be altered, watch this, by the things that you desire, y'all. Okay, I got to get out of science for a second because some of y'all don't like that. But the truth of the matter is that there are some things that you will pass down yes, to your children. So when we deal with the effects of trauma, we're not just dealing with just one type of group or one type of response or one size fits all because everybody is all affected differently. 
I was traumatized at 17 years old. I was on a dark road going to my father's church, ran off the road by a drunk driver into a ditch, flipped over three times, cracked my sternum, ran to a near house that my dad forbid me to go to because it was a drug-infested house. They had pit bulls outside, but I couldn't find my cell phone, and I was the only house that had a light on. So I literally crawled a half a mile to the house. The pit bulls were on chains, and they were screaming at me, and I called, I called, I called. I said, can I use your phone? He said, well, is that your car? You survived that? Man, I don't even know how you survived that. He said, yeah, we can call the police, but guess what? You're going to have to, I said, well, can you, I mean, I can't walk. If you've ever had any type of chest issue, it will also affect the way you walk. You, you, you can't really walk if you've ever dealt with any uh, uh, thing in your chest or a sternum issue. He said, yeah, man, here's the thing. I can call the cops for you. But you're going to have to walk back to the car. And I ain't had no cops coming up in here. I'm like, dude, I just almost died. And you're going to tell me to walk back. I didn't walk here. But anyway, I was traumatized by that. I'm going, a, a, a car or someone helping me, I'll do it for myself. Why? Because the person that I thought could help me uh, uh, gave me the bare minimum to help me. So guess what? I, 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 I develop a trust thing. When, when you give me a minimum response, I uh, become aggressive because I'm like, if you're going to help me, just tell me you're all in. Okay, so some people, they are affected by trauma, they overreact, they're, they're over underwhelmed, they face depression, they have racing thoughts, they can't calm down. Some people, when they're affected by trauma, they become very lethargic, they become very numb to whatever's around them, they shut down, they have anxiety, depression, fear, excessive anger, excessive weeping. Mental and physical exhaustion, exhaustion, lack of motivation. That's right, that's right. Some people, when they're affected by trauma, they apologize for everything. Yeah. Have you ever met somebody they apologize for everything? Yeah. Like, can I have a fork? Oh, it's, I'm sorry. Yeah, here's a fork. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, some of the guys are like not looking at me because you like, I married somebody that apologized for every every single thing. A, a, a person there just apologize. It, there's no even. There's no need to apologize. There's like nothing to apologize. But they feel the significance to apologize. Self-criticism. Uh-oh. Self-criticism. What you tell yourself is everything. Someone can tell you that you are amazing, but if you don't believe it yourself, you will never. When you look in the mirror, what do you tell yourself? What are the self? What are the thoughts that you tell? Uh, oh, do you point out everything that's wrong with you, and you can't find anything that's right with you? Yes, I'm talking to you, anointed man. I'm talking to you, you, you woman of God who keep posting scriptures on your Facebook page. But when a man tries to date you, you're just as insecure as the next female. Driving a nice car, driving a Bentley, driving a BMW, but insecure. Why? Not because anybody never appreciated you, but you never appreciated yourself. What? Yes, I did. I got a job. I got money. I got a career. I got every I don't need no man. But be privately on the phone with your girlfriend. Tell my girl, I, I just don't know why. I, I, I just don't know. I just don't like myself. I just don't love myself no more. I just don't. Y'all better be stop believing what everybody posting on social media. Because the same folks that post this stuff on social media, like their, lab, their life is great, they operate in grandiosity, which simply means they, they appear one way, but they're equally the other way fatigue laughing joking minimizing sarcasm dismissive overreacting what's this uh, uh, excessive sleeping Don't mess my message up, bitch. D 
denial. Some people in your life are not being negative. They're being, they're being completely honest. But you keep living in denial and telling everybody they're being negative. You just get all the negative people out of your life. Everybody in your life ain't being negative. Sometimes you need somebody in your life to tell you that hairstyle does not look good on you. You need somebody, see y'all, see, I got to come down to y'all. Some of y'all, y'all, sometimes you need, I, I, listen, I don't need no friend in my life that can't tell me I got food in my beard. I got a beard. I live the beard life. If you can't tell me I got something in my nose, I got something in my beard, you can't be my friend. See how practical I had to break that down? I couldn't even. You actually need people in your life that will tell you the truth. Everybody that tells you the truth ain't being negative. I wish I was going to have more people that would help me up in here. But the reason why we don't like the truth is because we live away from the truth. Here, 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 here's the other part. So you said, well, how is all of this tied to this story? Because they're rebuilding the wall. These people are completely traumatized, Pastor. They have, had, they have had other nations pillage, destroy their families. They have literally gone through so much trauma. The temple was torn down. The wall was torn down. The gates were completely burned. When they came against another nation or another, uh, 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 another uh, uh, army or whatever, these, these people... The reason why Nehemiah is in Persia is because That's they right. shipped him away right. as a prisoner and as a slave. That's right. That's right, sir. Tell it. So Nehemiah's assignment, Pastor Chris, although he's rebuilding the wall, I have discovered that he's doing more than just rebuilding the wall. He's willing to rebuilding the people. Yes, Watch this. But before a people can be rebuilt, the persons have to be rebuilt. Yes, and before the person can be rebuilt, I have to build you what up? Not just by the strength of your hand, but the strength of your heart. And by the strength of your mind. And by the strength of your intellect. Guess what? Some people, they want to be strong physically, but guess what? Dwarfed emotionally. So the Bible says in Nehemiah 2 verse, verse 10, oh, it says... That Sambada and Tobiah, they, they, they were stirred that, disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being. The word well-being there is also welfare. And welfare is not what I'm talking about, Section 8 or Government Assisted Program. When I talk about welfare, we're talking about social services that deals not just with money, but deal with the well-being of a person. So Sanballat and Tobias get some type of intel that knows if you can rebuild the wall, something's going to shift in the people. He didn't say that he has come to rebuild the wall because they really didn't have a complete clue of why he was there. But he knew that if Nehemiah showed up, if somebody showed up concerned about the people, Something was going to shift. Y'all, y'all, y'all. If so, oh, God. Okay. So he's on an assignment to rebuild the people. They rebuilt the temple but didn't rebuild the wall. The temple represents a vertical relationship with God. And the wall not only fortified their lives from their adversaries, but it also protected the community and the relationships they're built. <sighs> the revelation that I saw or the insight that I got is that some of you are so vertically responsible but horizontally irresponsible. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, here. You spend, you spend three hours praying before the Father. 
but the but you can't even go on a date with your husband. You vertically responsible. I have to get into the face of God. I have to get into the face of God. Well, I, we see that by your professional career, you haven't had a job in 15 years. Why can't you find it? Well, because there's demonic activity on my job that keeps me limited because they don't understand how anointed I am. They don't understand how gifted I am. And when God sends me into the workplace, I'm on assignment. And them demons are trying to fight me, trying to destroy me. But if the saints really do an investigation, I'm trying to help somebody. If the saints really do an investigation, it ain't been no demon on the job. If we ask those former employees, they will call you a demon because you come in with a nasty attitude. You don't talk to nobody. You stay to yourself. You try to take over meetings. Instead of staying in your place, you all over the place. Blaming everything on the devil. You just refuse to deal with the trauma in your life. I am not rebuking the devil off your life. That ain't, that ain't the devil right there. That's you making the decision to live in your past versus growing up to live in your future. You have made a choice. To blame everybody why you can't get to where God wants you to be. You have magnified a garden snake. You have magnified a garden snake and made him Lord over your life. So now you can't get there because of what the enemy tells you. I ain't that deep, Bishop. truth of the matter is 1 John 4 tells us how can you say that you love me who you have can't see but hate your brother you do see and you trying to figure out why is my life in balance why is it that I can't get a breakthrough why can't I get to this level why can't I get to that God you have said so much over my life you've done some of it is timing some of it is waiting but some of it is maybe God wants you to deal with the trauma in your life he wants you to deal with the stuff that nobody can see Why is everybody trying to destroy you? Why does everybody, why does everybody not want you to, to succeed? Your mama don't want you to succeed. Your cousin don't want you to succeed. Your friends on Facebook, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, y'all better be careful. Y'all better be, okay, I'm trying to help the people of God. You better be careful. You better be careful. With, 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 with all the people that you're carrying in your life and all the different people you're listening to because some of these people are pseudo-spiritual trying to tell you and guess what? They create a narrative in your mind of hatred, low self-esteem and, and watch this uh oh, I'm getting and call it spiritual warfare some of this stuff ain't spiritual warfare some of it is you simply need to get beyond your trauma Okay. I believe in spiritual warfare. I'm an intercessor. I pray. I seek the face of God. But guess what? There are certain things in my life I simply got to work on. How is it, how is it that you're going to pray and fast for your spouse but not talk, talk to your spouse? How do we expect God to shift something when he's looking back at you and saying, I done gave you everything. I done gave you a good word at church. You got good health insurance. You can go and get a therapist. 
and everything is on YouTube. You can get a teletherapist, you can get a telecounselor. We, Pastor, as a people in this generation, have no excuse to live defeated. No excuse to live restricted. There are way more resources in this than that. Y'all ain't got to help me because I know it. There are way more resources to change your life outwardly, inwardly, emotionally, mentally, every way. And the, the problem is, here's the problem. People just don't take advantage of it. I want to change this. I want to do this. I want to go after this. I want to go after this. I want to go after this. Okay, so how are you going to do it? I don't know. It's trauma. Let me give you this. So here's this. The real work of the wall was done before anything was ever picked up. A tool, a brick, or anything. The real work started in the mind. And you say, okay, well, where did that happen? Since you, <laughs> where did it happen? Because I don't see that it happened. The scripture says in Nehemiah 2, verse 17, Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in. You see the distress that we are in. Notice he didn't isolate himself from them. He didn't just say, what you in? He said, what we are in, you are dealing with, you need people in your life that are willing to carry the burden with you. You want to get through this? We're going to get this through the, we're going to get through this together. You want to fight this? I'm in the fight with you. You need people that are willing to not, watch this, not to isolate your issue or isolate your problem and make it your issue and not willing to carry the weight to help you through it. So Nehemiah, Nehemiah does something very significant. And if you're going to overcome any trauma in your life, this is what Nehemiah does. And Nehemiah, I don't even think Nehemiah knows what he just did. The first thing to overcoming trauma is you have to revisit the trauma. He's, he says in the text, you see the distress that we are in and Jerusalem lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire. He didn't try to avoid it and go, we're going to overcome. We're going to take over to this, and we're going to take over that. He made the people visualize themselves and see themselves in the trauma. The only way to overcome the trauma is that sometimes you have to sit in the memory of the trauma. Oh, Sometimes you have to endure the pain of the trauma. Sometimes you have to revisit the thoughts of you being, uh, of what happened to you at the age of five. You have to revisit what happened to you when you were in the military. You have to revisit what happened to you on your job. Sometimes you have to mentally allow yourself to go there. And Nehemiah is operating like a therapist. Yes. And saying, guess what? In order for us to read and build this wall, I need you to see the real condition of this wall. I'm not going to stand here and lie to you that everything is simply going to be all right. No, it's jacked up. It's ruined. It's a mess. We had to see the distress that they were in. Can you see the distress that you are in? So the first thing that you have to do to overcome any level of trauma is you must, one, first revisit it. I'm not telling you <laughs> to stay there, but to overcome it, you got to go there. You can't just sweep, keep sweeping your emotional trauma under the rug. You got to go back to the source. So, okay, let me say it this. If your daddy was never there for you and he is still alive and he locked up in prison and you have dealt with issues, daddy issues, you know, that, that 
that'll help some of you guys. Your daddy issues, trust issues. How about you get yourself up, go in the car, and go to that prison, and sit down and talk with your daddy. And free yourself. I'm trying to get people healed. I don't know about you. Because you can't hold someone hostage. And you can't hold yourself hostage to your past. I know you said, I, 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 I hear some of your mind. So you don't know how bad it was. You don't know how devastating it was. I know, guess what, how devastating it is for you to die with all those dreams and gifts in you. If your mama was abusive to you and God, she has passed on and went to glory and, and, she, and, and her grave site is miles and miles away, book a ticket and go to her grave site. See, I just have to go to her grave site and free yourself. your baby daddy I'm going to leave it at that you need to go and free yourself I don't care who you dating I don't care who your other baby mama is I ain't calling my friends talking about the drama in your life because guess what what really matters to me is where I'm going I can no longer be focused I can no longer focus my mind because the more you magnify distrust, you become the person that nobody can trust. Because you see everything through the lens of distrust. Go get free. I was in South Carolina, and I went to visit some ministry friends of mine when I was visiting my mom. I went there, Pastor, and the Lord, when I sat down, the Lord told me, as great as this, uh, the husband, their, their ministry is booming, it is, it is expanding, the Lord told me to tell the, 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 the wife, which she's amazing, she's brilliant, she's anointed, she's gifted. I had, I sat down and it overtook me, the word prodigal father. And I didn't understand that because everybody talks about the prodigal son. And I said, for, the, for your ministry to go to the next dimension, this is not, a, this next dimension is not about how gifted and anointing, anointed you, you are going to be. This next level of your ministry is going to, is all about healing. And in order to break forth the healing that people are going to need, there's one thing God is going to ask you to do. I said, where does, and she looked at me strange. She said, I said, where does your father live? He goes, he lives about two hours away. I said, you need to go get your father. I said, when the last time you talked to your daddy? She said, I hadn't talked to him in a while. Ain't nobody really seen him. He calls me every now and again. I said, can I tell you that the, that the people, the nation is waiting on you to get healed. I prophesied that to a woman in May, but that's for somebody here. That, that guess what? The next measure of what God wants to do in your life has nothing to do with your gifting and your talent. It, it has everything to do with your ability to go get healed. Okay, I'm out of town. So. Just let that marinate like Nick Bone Juice. Maybe what you're trying to get God, provoke God to do, he's trying to get you to do. Yeah. Healing. Come on. Somebody shout, healing. healing. See, some of y'all, 
I, I love the fact that we lingered in worship today because I've discovered that everybody really doesn't come to church for the same reason. Right, sir. Right. Some of y'all come for hype, right. but some of us come to get healed. Right. Right. I don't know about you, but worship is therapy to me. I don't know about you, but guess what? When I can find myself in the presence of God, when I can find myself lifting up my hands, when I can find myself, I can focus my attention. Why? Because the enemy been, been trying to torment my mind, been trying to torment my, 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 my destiny. But guess what? When I'm able, when I don't feel like I have the power to do it within myself, I can get in the sanctuary. I don't care what you got. I don't care what your mask look like. I don't care if you're if, you're, if, if you got a, a weave or is that your real hair, I don't care how you look. What I want to do is I have come to the potter's house, Lord, to get healed. For the rest of the year, I want to prophetically declare, do not come in this church for the hype. Do not come in this church to just be moved emotionally. But somebody needs to come desperate to say, God, I want to be healed. I want my mind set free. I want my family free. So if that means we got to worship together because there's something about the truth that will oh God will deactivate there's something about the truth that will deactivate your trigger there's something oh y'all don't want something about the truth that would deactivate the trigger that causes it I need you to just high five somebody and tell her I have come to get healed. When the water gets stirred, whether somebody's preaching or not, I've come to get healed. I, I got more emotional wounds, emotional scars that I can even roll out for you. But I have come into this house to get healed. I didn't come for a husband. I didn't come for a wife. I didn't come for a business partner. I have come to get healed. I have come to get healed. There's too much sickness trying to kill us. There's too much disease trying to kill us. For us to play church, I have come to get. I want to be healed. I don't want last year to look like, I don't want this year to look like last year. I want to be healed. I want to be healed in every area of my life. Look at somebody and tell them I want to be healed. Even if it costs me our friendship, even if it costs me for you to feel as though I'm distancing myself from you, tell them it ain't about you. It ain't about what we had. It's about the reason why maybe I'm changing because I am changing. Maybe I'm shifting because I am shifting. Maybe you met me on a level that I'm no longer on because I want to be. You want God to miraculously heal you, and I believe in that type, but there's some type of healing that you gotta press in for. There's some type of healing that you say, God, if you're gonna heal me, I'll be right here every single day. I'll be like the beggar on the road, so I'll be like the beggar at the gate called Beautiful. I'll be there saying, alms anyone? Silver and gold, I have none, but such as I have, I give on. Y'all gotta help me some more. Everybody push me. Such as I have, I give unto you. You think money is gonna answer your problem, but can I tell you, you can be talented, you can have money and still be broken. You can have money, you can have a car, you can, and still be. Some of y'all looking at me crazy right now, but would you prophesy to somebody and tell them be healed, be healed. That's why God sent us through this pandemic. This is why God sent us through this, to rip off the band-aid of the stuff we tried to hide. That's why God sent us through it. That's why we went through, God ripped off the band-aid and said, I just don't want a strong church. I want a healed church. I don't want a strong church. I want a healed church. strong church he want a heal church 
self-medicating yourself and your problems, self-medicating yourself and your issues, allowing building your life, building the infrastructure of your life with walls that guess what nobody can get in. Guess what? You're going to have to deal with the trauma. You're going to have to sit down and talk to somebody. You're going to have to sit down with a pastor. You're going to have to enroll yourself in the grief and loss. And guess what? No matter who's on there, no matter what is happening, enroll it because grief is trying to destroy you. But this year, I make a declaration, declaration that I am going to be healed. Can somebody help me in the room that God has ever healed of anything to help me in the room and say Lord this year I want to be healed no more addiction no more lies no more insecurity no more insignificance no more triggers I am It costs what it costs. I got to do what I got to do. And here's what the text says. The text says that he made them revisit. After you revisit the trauma, watch this. You have to remap the trauma. You have to revisit, but then you have to remap. When you remap the trauma, you are acknowledging that the trauma has happened. You are acknowledging every person you are acknowledging, but you now are going to free yourself when you remap. When you remap yourself, you tell your brain, you tell your will, you tell Tell your emotions this was not my fault I did not bring this on myself I did I was not oh God if I would have did this some of you faced the tra trauma of saying if I would have did this this would not happen but God says watch this when you remap you understand that this is is what it was but I can't be bound by what it was so I'm willing to say guess what you said this about me but that is not who I really I made the mistake, but I am not fully the mistake. I know what I said, but guess what? I'm moving beyond what I said. I got to remap my thoughts. I got to change my mind. I got to change the outcome. In order to change the outcome, I got to speak over my life because life and death is in the power of the tongue. And I have to declare over everything in my life. I care less what it was, but I am significant. I am more than enough. God has gifted me. God made me. God restored me. My pain, my trauma is not who I am. I am a son of God. I am a daughter of the king. I know what I've been through, but I'm remapping my thoughts. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. I need somebody to remap some things in your life. The truth of the matter is, your childhood was jacked up. Your daddy was, was nothing, but that doesn't mean you have to settle for being nothing. You have to remap your thoughts. You're helping us. You're helping us. You have to remap them. Yeah. Yeah. You can't keep blaming yourself for what happened to you because the more you blame yourself the more you take ownership of something that you were never designed to bear so they left they left but you're here and as devastating as the, the leaving is I am not bound to your leaving I'm bound to my call. Yes, sir. And if you decide to leave, I got to remap my thinking. Yes, sir. And some of you, the reason why you can't get free is because your mind is mapped to something that happened 20 years ago. And wherever you map is where you walk. The map is how you find destinations. 
And maybe the place you're living is because you got the same old map. Doing like the children of Israel. Going in circles. Because you, you won't let God reroute. And show you that there's more than what you see on that map. Woo. So when you revisit, you have to remap. Listen, these are not always, I got to tell people, this is not, I do one, two, three, and it's done. Sometimes you have to do them daily. I am not telling y'all that it is a one, it will be fixed in one day. I would tell you that sometimes it is a daily process. Sometimes it's a daily, it, it is a daily thing that I got to rewrap my thinking. That just because my boss came to me about something doesn't necessarily mean I'm insignificant. Or that because they came, they're hating on me or don't like me. I realize that sometimes the people that are on you see more in you than you see in yourself. So when you re revisit, you have to remap. And when you remap, let me tell you what ends up happening. That if power and death is locked in your tongue, yes, there is something that we call resilience. Yes. Watch this. Because the Bible says... That they built the wall, they said, they immediately after he said, this devastation is here. But we will no longer be a reproach. We will no longer be a dis disappointment. Something switched in their mind. And they said, we will build. Over 50 years, they walked around the ruined place. Their kids playing with rocks and they're throwing rocks at each other. And one word shifted their outlook on the rubble in their life. One word shifted the rubble, the rubbish relationships that are in their life. That they looked at the devastation and still saw destiny. Let us rise up. The wall had to be built up, but it couldn't be built up until the people rose up. And maybe you're trying to change something in your life, but the change ain't going to happen with you just sitting there doubting and questioning yourself. You're going to have to rise up in order for it to be built up. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Maya Angelou said this, you may not control the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. The Bible says that they said we will rise up and we will rebuild. Out of this ruined situation, we're going to rise. The work of your hands is controlled by the work in your mind. Yes, yeah. So they put their hands to something because their mind told them it was time to rebuild. Can I prophesy to somebody in here? God is setting you up for a bounce back. God is setting you up. Because this time, your healing requires work. And if you're willing to do the work, if you're willing to do the work, you'll bounce back. If you're willing to go beyond, to do whatever you have to do to be healed, to be restored, to rise up. Because after you revisit and remap, you know what will come over you? 
what will come over you is a resilience to say that is what it was but we will rise I'm gonna go after it I'm gonna see it I'm gonna see the victory because the battle belongs to our God 